two old friends catching up again. <laughs> yes. Oh, and I must thank you, Amir, before we start the whole proceeding one for, uh, you know, your uh, when you spoke about Yusuf Palampur, uh -huh. um, he was in college with me and we studied uh -huh. together. So, <laughs> no, but that was important to tell him. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah. I'll just introduce the group and everyone in here involved. So, we are collaborators group. We kind of sessions four times a week. Four times a week. <laughs> <laughs> Even that is too much. For <laughs> we have Thursday writing sessions where we come here every Thursday and sit and write for two hours and then discuss what we did. On Saturdays, we have craft session, writing craft session where we discuss the famous short story, poem, uh, books, and try to learn from these authors. On Sundays, we have feedback sessions where people bring their pieces and we read them out and give feedback on them. And on Mondays, we have a book club, which is run by Shankar and is catered towards learning about classics. So currently, we are reading uh, Unbearable Like This of Being. And did I miss any exploring? The people we have here. Uh, Born and brought up in Karachi, Amir Hussain spent 28 formative months in Indore, Gwalior, Bombay, and Uttakamun. If I'm pronouncing it. Uti. Very sorry. Before moving to England, he is 15 in 1970. He later took a degree in history, Persian, and Urdu from SOAS and has since divided his time between writing and teaching. Amir's book, books include the story collection, The Blue Direction, Insomnia, Petsa and Bridges, and Sindhagi Safari. Two novels. Another Gulmo Tree and the Cloud Mission, and a collection of essays on Urdu literature, House of Treasures. We have Priya here with us. Uh, Priya Sadukai Chavriya is an award winning poet, writer, translator, and curator of 11 books that include four poetry collections, two science fiction or speculative fiction novels, uh, <laughs> translations from classical Tamil, literary nonfiction, a novel, and two poetry anthologies. She won the Muse India Translation Prize 2017. Kitab Experimental Story Award and Best Reads from Women's Stress 2018. She has also been recognized for outstanding contribution to literature by the government of India. She is the founder editor of Poetry at Sangam. Uh, Dipa Jyoti is joining us online. Uh, Dipa Jyoti Sharma is a writer and editor, has published three volumes of poetry, last being Book of Prayers for the Non Believer 2018, and four books of translations. The last being I'm your poet. Select poems of Nilim Kumar 2022 <laughs> and two academic books, besides numerous short stories and articles in journals. He was born in Assam and now lives in Delhi, where he works as a journalist and does the independent publishing venture that they were. Which is just a short introduction for the huge amount of work he does with Red River. Kutarita Dadrasani is a writer and independent. Independent book editor based in Pune. She is the author of Cast Out and Other Stories. She is the recipient of the 2013 International Dastan Award for her short story Rare View. In 2008, she received the Oxford Bookstore Debuting Writers Second Award. Her stories and book reviews have appeared in various literary journals and anthologies. She edits Red River Story, an imprint of Red River. She is fiction editor for the Bangalore Review and teaches a course in writing and editing to postgraduate students at Simbas College of Arts and Commerce. So these are our four guests here. Uh, what we're doing today is introducing Red River Story, which is a fiction imprint of Red River and Amir uh, book, What is Safe. So Red River literally means the Brahmagotra. So like how Brahmagotra uh, threads through our various countries, we've brought together various countries here. So I'll hand it over to our guests to Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to you now. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi. Hello, everybody. And uh, first, a round of thank yous. Thank you to Pune Writer Groups for That's organizing good. this, taking the trouble. Thank you to uh, Vishal and Neha of uh, Bagdandi, who has been a huge supporter of Red River. And thank you to Amir Hussain for agreeing to work with us. I mean, like that, that is like, you know, 
and this was a privilege for both uh and, me. and thank you to priya for being here and she has been with us like you know for especially personally for me for a long time uh you know from the days like you know when she used to organize poetry readings in uh the space open space from those days you know and uh you know and then i'm so happy uh to introduce Red River Story in Pune because the Pune was where I started my writing career. I published my uh, first poetry collection in 20, uh, 2004 and it was launched in open space in Pune. And then, uh, you know, so this was the place where I grew up literally and fig uh, figuratively. So I'm really glad to be returning to Pune and introduce our new venture here. Uh, so about Red River Story, before I start Red River Story, I may have to mention Red River. Uh, so what happened is, so like, you know, as Pia would know, I was writing poetry. And in the uh, the early millennium or like, you know, earlier, there were not uh, before the internet came in, because we are a pre-internet generation. So there wasn't many poetry publishing presses. So when I was like, you know, struggling to publish my poetry, my first poetry book came out from Writer's Workshop. When I was struggling to publish my second poetry book, there was no viable option. Then I thought, why not like, you know, try to do it myself. So I started my first uh, po uh, po my second collection myself, and then when I got the book out, then my friends who were mostly uh, the poets, they said, "Why don't you do our book also? Because your production is good, your like you know quality is good." And then you know it, I said, "Okay, we'll do a couple of books and shut down and do something else." And then after, one after another, the book kept coming and like you know keep doing it. Now five years later, we have like you know more than hundred books, uh, and then it has a uh, uh, I mean, like, uh, nice visibility, I should say, and people have appreciated our work. I'm thankful to them for their support. And, uh, okay, then now we are starting Red River Story. This is a, I would say, prose imprint, not necessarily a fiction imprint, like, you know, fiction limits the possibilities. It's a prose imprint as opposed to poetry. Uh, then we are discussing uh, uh, why, why Red River Story? why we need to do that because like you know the the publishing scenario in india right now is really booming it's uh, the big publisher everybody is doing good work so in that case why do we need a new publisher and what is the you know, space we are working on so we have had a big discussion with society about that so i must say the first thing for the reason that i started the reverse story because society agreed to edit it <laughs> Without her, it would have never started. Like, you know, that was the first uh, rule. I said, like, you know, as long as you are here, if you handle it, I'm go game. And second thing, then we had a long discussion about our scope, like, you know, what we are bringing to the table, what the others are not doing. So then we found this space in shorter fiction. Because, like, the, there is a whole argument happening of people don't read and, like, you know, stuff like So, that's okay, let's introduce shorter fiction. Like, you know, uh, which bigger publisher would not would not probably take up because of their like you know reasons marketing and other reasons uh, but there are a lot of opportunities there like you know short stories and uh, novellas uh, i come from assam uh, and i grew up reading assamese uh, our language and then in assam we have this uh, you know, special magazine that come during puja uh puja special and there we will have a lot of short fiction novellas which can you can read in one sitting you know uh say 40 50 000 words i thought that is a good uh way to introduce like you know um introduce to readership who are not used to reading like, because a lot of people uh approach me and say, oh this is a very bad book i don't want to read that you know so that is one uh way of doing it and second thing I have been in Delhi for last uh, 10 years. I don't want to like, you know, I, I don't want to go against what mainstream publishers do, but I understand their reasons because it's like, it's a business. It's a, uh, you know, they need to earn money. But what happens with mainstream publishers, there are stories, there are uh, texts which the mainstream publisher would not touch because 
they are not viable in terms of marketing, but they are good stories, important stories, especially stories for small towns, stories uh, about like you know communities not represented enough, those kind of stories. So we are looking at we think this is a space where we can uh, you know disseminate these stories and like you know uh, introduce it to the readership. And I think <laughs> let's hope so. And for example, uh, like, you know, the uh, Amir's book, for example, like and the way uh, he does it for a lot of, like, you know, I'm not sure, but I'm just saying uh, for uh, mainstream publishers, maybe difficult to, like, you know, because they want to uh, pigeonhole everything, right? Everything, like, how do you figure it out? How do you uh, put it in a box? So we are sort of unboxing. We're not trying to, like, you know, limit this into different uh, sections. Okay, this is a fiction, non-fiction. As long as it is a good story. Uh, so, Charita, should I add something else? <laughs> <laughs> Up to you. Uh, yeah, I think I should not hog the limelight. Over to you and over to Amir. And thank you again for, like, you know, we had the pleasure doing your book and, like, you know, working with and I. And, and you know, it, was, it was fantastic. And, like, you know, we are happy that, like, you know, well, what is it? Well begun is something like that, no? So we have. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> of course, I'm delighted, absolutely delighted to be holding this book and launching it. Um, because it is, well, we'll talk about it later, but you know, even the title, Life Stories and Other Tales, what is saved immediately is both a question and a statement. And it points to both and more, I think. And this is a book which constantly tells you there is more in every way, breaking through genre conventions, breaking through uh, what you would call poetry, what you would not call poetry. For instance, I mean, since all of you are writers here, what is poetry? Would you say it's just the way words are put on the page, or is it actually a sensibility, a way of approaching the world, a way of receiving its essential stimuli? That I think is poetic, uh, a sensibility which comes out in the writing. And of course, Amir's is absolutely, um, uh, it is distilled language that is there in this book. And here I want to say that congratulations to Red River. And also, I think Sucharita is the best choice as editor here, yeah. not just because of your deep appreciation of Amir's work, but because of the writer Sucharita that I know and the affinities I see in your work and Amir's, you know, which is lyrical. It's meditative. It um, speaks about, uh, it is contemplative, draws deeply from the spiritual. So, at the end, the, the care with which both of them use language is again, I think, another very strong link. That's a huge compliment. Thank you. I know, I know, I know how much you love Amir's writing, but this is what I saw. And um, I would say that say, Sucharita's uh, writing is more like a river in its strong flow, and that she draws from various sources of women's forgotten voices, myth, land, stories of land. And of course, both of them speak of memory deeply. Uh, it is driven through with ideas of memory and travel. And Amir's. Amir, your book, I think, is reminds me a bit about um, of Basho's Travels to the Deep North, you know, because it is a poetic distillation, a travel through life's journeys. It is brief in its sections and yet deeply, deeply, I think, spiritual. So um, I'll I think I should read what I wrote about this book briefly, you know, in one of the 
uh, write-ups that they are kind enough to publish. And this is it. I said, Amir Hussein's book is a stunning collection of elegant, elusive stories that pulse us into the everyday and the ephemeral with precise, heartbreaking lyricism. Straddling fiction, memoir, and poetry, each story vibrates with spiritual death to give us a master at the height of his creative powers. I stand by that, Amir, absolutely. But I wondered, you know, as a writer, I was thinking, why didn't I think of the pillow books which the Japanese wrote? And this is so much a contemporary pillow book, this collection, because there you have the poetry, you have uh, chronicles of friendship, of travel, the <laughs> melding of fiction and nonfiction, History, you have that too. And, um, you know, at its core, it, it of course is resonant and it has this distilled language. And I think it has the vivid uh, reality of dream. It is intense. And uh, in many ways, it takes us back to recollection and not just recollection, but reconciliation. Because this book, also speaks of pain, of living in the now, of loss. So it's these vast, not swathes, but vast underground also streams that it is covering, I think. OK? Well, thank you for that smile, Amir. I'm happy about it. And before I end, I just wanted to make one a comment, or to make, you know, which so Charita might like to pick up earlier. Of course, it is a book of, which has a lot of ellipses. And these are, uh, when you think of ellipses, you're thinking of time only in writing, elliptical. You drop sections of time. Amir uses ellipses of space. One moment you're in London, next moment you're in Lahore, you're in Uti. So there are these constant ellipses as well. And then at least a third, that is language. You're reading English. You're reading something from the Urdu. You're jumping into phrases from the French. And of course, Farsi, Persian, you know. And the, the references to various world literatures keeps coming through here. So that is also, in a sense, the way you're jumping through time, through space, through language. And I think with that, I will just say thank you very much, all of you, for this book review. It's thank a you. wonder. Thank you so much. After that effusive and glowing <laughs> speech. Uh, I, I'm going to sound mundane and banal to all of you. So please bear with me now. <laughs> so how did this come about? Uh, I made just two minutes and then we'll come to you. Yeah. Uh, in June 2022, Divya Jyoti suddenly called me up one day and said, listen, I'm going to start. I want to start a prose imprint. And uh, will you be the editor for it? And in the same breath, he warns me that there's going to be no payment. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I was mad and he was madder. But uh, <laughs> and therefore, two days later, I came back to say yes. To you. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, because madness is not a crime. But uh, not following that madness, yes, definitely, that's what heartbreak is made of. I realized that. And uh, then a few months after we started work on this imprint, I was chatting with Amir one day and he asked me, what have you been up to? And I told him that I'm editing a fiction imprint, a prose imprint. And he said, why don't you publish my book? Now, I, I assure you that between my telling him about what I'm doing and his offering this, we did not have time to even blink, neither of us, of us. yeah? But when he said what he did, I blinked. 
Okay, and I went back to Divya, and Divya was immediate in his response. He said, no, no, we can't afford to pay our mirrors and any advance. Okay, so I turned messenger girl and came back to Amir. <laughs> and Amir said, well, I'm not bothered about the money. What I want is a good book published. And that was a blessing. That also made us realize that while we were looking at India for our stories, we actually could spread the canvas to the subcontinent. You know, and all the shared uh, histories and stories and languages and cultures, all of that was waiting, you know, to be tapped into. So, Amir, thank you so much for that. Faith My that, pleasure. My pleasure. You know, and so we have the first of the first six titles from Red River Story. We have this wonderful book, What is Saved? I shall talk about it a little more. But Amir, would you like to say something about how this book came about? How, I mean, your version of it. And yes, I mean, I mean, there are so many different ways of approaching it. I think you've been telling me for a while that there haven't been a book of mine out in India for some years. Uh, and my last book came out in India in 2014. And you've been reading my stories and even writing about them, the ones that have been published in Pakistan and here. And when we spoke about your short story in print, in a sense, there was a veiled invitation there, which is why I so quickly said, he said, you want mine? And you said, yes. Well, it came back to me. I just remember that was all very quick. But the stories had been coming out. And in fact, there'd been about three incarnations in a sense. There was a little book called uh, Love in Its Seasons that came out in England in 2017. And the first few stories that I collected here were in that book. And then there was an expanded version in Pakistan called Hermitage. What we were doing at that time, what I was doing at that time, was that I was really very interested in uh, folk tales, pseudo folk tales, retellings of Sufi um, parables, retellings of uh, Buddhist mythology, and and so on, and less in myself. But as we came to Hermitage, my publisher in Pakistan said there were two or three pieces floating around that she wanted to include, and I said these are actually not. Uh, they're not stories, they're, they're, they're memoirs. And she says, well, you know, they're told like stories. You're a storyteller and you've told them this way. So Hermitage already was a little bridge between, if you like, you know, uh, fantasy, imagination and memory and history, because there's a story in Hermitage, which is called uh, Life and Death of a Bird that's taken straight from the life of Shifta. So it's like a pseudo chronicle, you know? So even in that fabulous form, I was touching on history. Then came the pandemic, then came personal events in my life, which are in the book, you know, the loss of my mother, the loss of my sister, all this within a few months and my own diagnosis with cancer. And my publisher in Pakistan said, how about a memoir now? And so did my friend, the uh, novelist Mirza Bahid in England. I couldn't write a straightforward memoir. I think you've been reading the stories all these years and you know that it was really hard for me to sit down and say, I am it Hussain did that this that and the other but in some of these pieces i've managed to do it in some pieces i cheated slightly changed names changed things here and there but then you haven't published a book of autobiographical essays you've published a book that navigates the distances between uh what we think what we remember what we tell what we recall and what we falsify but i think that with restless the book that i published just before this and in, in pakistan uh i did come pretty close to confessing what I could and couldn't do in the form of autobiography and how documentary I could be, how non-documentary I could be. So there are you know, uh, pieces like like that in the book, uh, both, both, both kinds of pieces. Whereas I think that with your selection here, you've gone more towards the memoirs that shade into fiction or the fiction that shades into memoir, not into the documentary stuff. So this is how it came about. I think, you know, you've judiciously chosen stories from two books and you got hold of two or three new ones entirely, which haven't been in book form before. So what my Indian readers have after six years is quite a new work. You know, it's uh, it's new and it's fresh for many people who haven't. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, um... We, uh, do you want to say something about the title to Amir? Uh, what is saved? Yes, well, I wrote that story in Urdu, and oddly enough, it's very prescient because it's 
it was before the pandemic, before the diagnosis of my illness and before my personal losses. And yet that story is so laden with uh, with portents of what's to come, you know? Yeah. It's poised on the brink of grief, of mourning, of memory, of war, of uh, uh, desolation, all sorts of things come into that. Yeah. The story was called Zindigi Se Pahile because of the painting, eponymous painting, which uh, is done by an artist I imagined entirely created from my imagination, but was inspired by an exhibition I visited of Lee Krasner's work. And in fact, she really is painting what is saved in terms of memory and so on and so forth. But by the time I came around, I immediately translated the work into English. It was the first of my old stories that I translated into English because it was commissioned. And I thought there's enough good material here. But I realized as soon as I translated it that that Zendiki Sepele before life didn't make sense in English. And the story is about what is saved because it's two friends. One is in his 60s, one is in her 70s. And they're both holding on to what is precious to them, to what is beloved, whether that's memory, whether that's friendship, uh, and trying to go beyond loss, trying to go beyond grief and mourning, try, try to go beyond desolation. And you know what we say in Urdu, uh, the troubles of the time and the troubles of your own life. And that is what we say, that is what is saved. And of course, to me, that became more poignant during the pandemic and during you know the periods of mourning where uh, you rely so much on what is saved and what is saved and what is saved can have been saved yesterday as it can have been saved 10 years ago, 100 years ago, if that makes sense. Yes. And then, you know, you've chosen the title, Batori Hui Khushia, and that's, you know, one of the final lines in the Urdu version of the story, those pieces of happiness we've gathered up. Yeah, the fragments of happiness. Yeah, yes. fragments of happiness. Yeah. So actually, uh, Dibya first suggested that we have what is saved as the title, and uh, Amir liked it immediately. And uh, while we were discussing the titles, the other titles, Amir happened to tell me that you know in the Urdu I have these these words for Tori Hui Kushia. and you know that those three words they were resonant with what what is saved means. So what what is saved could not convey, but Uri Hui Kushia, you know, filled that gap. So you know, we decided that we'll bring the two together. What is saved, but Uri Hui Kushia. So you are pushing the idea of this. You know, uh, there's this a uh, sense of optimism of hope running through even the most uh, intensely desolate of pieces in this book, and we wanted that to be carried forth. That you are at the end of the day collecting, gathering the fragments of happiness, mm. whatever is there. Yeah. So, which is why we have that. And of course, life stories and other tales, that was Amir's idea, because uh, we are blending genres here. We are actually crossing borders of genre, style, of uh, kind of cultures. And uh, it reminds me always of what uh, our, uh, Gitanjali Shri says in Red Samadhi, Sarhad Langte Hue. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, in so many ways, Sarhad hi lang rahe hai, because, you know, we are, uh, Amir's stories flow across these borders, or across these categories, like almost subterranean channels that uh, resurface in different forms. Like he said, we have tales, we have retellings of uh, Masnavis from the 12th and 13th centuries. We have, uh, you know, we have reimagined histories. We have life stories, memoir. So where do you know draw the line? And this is exactly what um, Red River Story is trying to do. You know, cross borders. We are not trying to hedge in, mm. unboxing, like Vipya said. Mm. So have You have this whole eclectic range across the book that uh, Priya also has mentioned. You have uh, Attar's Masnavi, like I mentioned, we have, you know, rendered into prose retelling. Then we have Shifta from the 19th century, we have Adha Zafri from the 20th century, we have Buddha, Edwin Arnold's Light of Asia, which is 1879, right? We have Super Lakshmi singing a razal, we have Kalidas, Ghalib, we have Suen, Iqbal Bano. I mean, it's an absolutely eclectic range. And you, we, we keep going back and forth in time and across all these categories, across all these genres. Yeah, and to add to that, what Ahmed does and what actually drew me to his stories uh, was this compression in style. 
it's it's compressed storytelling and it reminds me always of the structure of poetry and the expansiveness of poetic thought all of that brought to bear upon prose and an incomplete control it's the brevity of it, the compression of it it's like a master class in writing yeah so i i think um, all of that will also make more sense if we read from the book you know read a short story from the book uh, priya you wanted to read dove would you like to do that now sure. so i read Yes, I read from Dove, which is in two parts, very short, uh, as uh, Suchavita mentioned, you know, the brevity. It's like he's giving you little stepping stones, Amir does, not the entire. But just these stepping stones, which make it so immersive, so compelling for the reader to be drawn in, because you make yourself part of the story in the gaps, the silences in between. And here is that in two parts. The first part is a single sentence with a few commas, I think two or three. The second part has one full stop and a couple of commas. I'll just show the story to you. Okay, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, th this is how Dove looks on the page. Two paragraphs. The first paragraph is a single sentence, as she mentioned. Okay. Yeah. Dove, one. Often, on those long afternoons, in the old house in Bayadun, where sunlight spread golden carpets on the stones. And the older women had taken in the washing and the children were tired of playing hopscotch in the open compound or leaping from balcony to balcony. The girl would go to the terrace and shelter in a stone pavilion with a novel or write couplets in a notebook. And then, as if she'd invited it over, the dove would begin to call her from a tree. And its call would lie like a shadow on her skin. But she never saw the bird that gave her invisible companionship, com company. Two. For years after she left, and crossed borders and moved houses in Karachi, then Lahore, then Pindi, then back to Karachi, and was known as a country's queen of melancholic verse. She thought her invisible friend had abandoned her. Yes. But once in a top floor bedroom, in a tall empty house, in an Islamabad, paralyzed by strikes and demonstrations against a corrupt regime. As she stood looking out of the window at a flowering jacaranda, she heard the doves call from the tree's upper branches, and she wondered how its plaintive song would ever have seemed to her to be the harbinger of joys to come. Yeah. yeah. So Dove is in many ways the ideal story to take us into the book and into your writing in general. Uh, I, I remember you said that uh, Dove was inspired by something that you read about other yeah. Japanese uh, childhood. Yes, and indeed. Yes, her autobiography, which is called Jorahi Sabe Khabrirahi. And she recounted the story of the dove. And uh, of course, I changed it. But as soon as I read it, I think it was about the third time I was reading the book. I had bought it in Delhi in 2005. And this was 2017, I believe. I just said, I have to rewrite this, you know, and uh, fictionalize it. That's why I don't call her by any name or anything. And of course, in the second part, uh, facts change around because the way she describes 
hearing the Dalits in a different house, in a different moment, perhaps. But that house was very present in my mind. I had probably myself just come back from Islamabad a few weeks before, and I had been there during times of turmoil. So that story just came to me, and it came to me in something like 20 minutes, probably. I wrote it just sitting there. Uh, it poured out of me, and I hardly had to revise it. Yeah, you also said it was inflected by your own reveries. So what I what I would really like to you know ask you is where where does history segue into reverie when you're writing it? If it came to you in twenty minutes, what what mm -hmm. was the process? Well, I have to say that book is deeply rooted in history because it's quite a traditional autobiography memoir. It also has literary essays woven into the fabric of it because I mean she is a poet and a leading poet was a leading poet. So the history was there, but of course, you know, once I transported myself into that world, but I knew I don't know at all, but it did remind me of uh, Indore and Gwalior in my childhood, you know, how they lead and so on and so forth, but I spent holidays in. But the second part took me to the Islamabad I knew. So it was not so much reverie as an immediate memory, reminiscence, recalling of my times there. Okay. Uh, something, something like Shifta has absolutely nothing invented. It's just really what it does it's to compress in fact a very long essay that uh Adha Jafri also wrote about Shefta and the fact that I know Shefta's great-grandson very well so I was able to ask him some facts about it as well sure. about the whole story and those facts are in the background and the backdrop of the story but knowing them actually made it much richer for me and it was again something that I had decided it was more conscious this effort that was going to be very short and very terse and it probably took me a little longer to work on this one than it did on Dove. But it was very much the same sequence of time. Okay, so uh, this um, th this first part of the book, this section has a lot of retellings like we've been talking about. And mm -hmm. also, you know, uh, you have listened to stories. Mm -hmm. So yes. there is oral component also and Very then you're writing them down through your own imagination so i would like to refer to a story like uncle rafi now mm -hmm. uncle rafi was amir's mother's maternal uncle Mama Jack. Right. Yeah. yeah and amir uh, grew up listening to stories about him from the family so in uncle rafi and uncle rafi he was given to melancholia and he passed on uh, too soon in life he was a writer himself and he wrote uh, the legend of Daya Gujar, the bandit. That's right. So in Uncle Rafi, what um, Ahmed does is there is this oral narration, yeah, and there's a blending of voices. So uh, the stories that he has heard from his uh, family, then you have um, Uncle Rafi's own retelling of the legend of Daya Gujar. And you have Ahmed remembering how his grandmother used to sing those lines. Mm -hmm. And Amir is writing about it. Okay, so there are all of these layers. And you know, I'd really like to know how, how did you go about writing the story? It has an inherent polyphony, not overt, but it's inherent. How what was the uh, process of writing? Oh, that, that was really very much just a trip down the unconscious, the way I put it together. I mean, it was basically asking my mother questions, more and more questions about Uncle Rafi, reading his stories. And then ringing up my mamu, who was in Ahmedabad at the time, and asking him what he remembered about uh, Rafi Esmeri. Also, my friend, the writer Asif Farukhi in Karachi, who oh, is dead, you know, uh, very early loss. He died at 60 during the pandemic. He gave me some uh, a handful of facts as well. So put, I put those facts together. The uh, Inclusion of Daya Gujar, he doesn't actually retell the story. He just transcribes the poem as he heard it sung. I mean, that the ballad. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't say where he heard it. It's called Gawar or Tonki Geet, the piece that he writes. And he says that women have this law that actually preserves the stories of the regions more than any written piece of work. Yeah, I think he's making a very kind of... Uh, uh, prescient statement before it's time because he was writing in the late 20s or early 30s he died i think in 1936 or 7 and uh, that that really drew me the in fact i mean the way that he transcribes it and the way that my grandmother sang it had a few different words in it here and there so it's interesting that how even a brother and sister can slightly differently remember the words of a song that belongs as it were to both of them and to no one 
Would you like to read from the last bit of Uncle Rafi? Okay, let me find it. You mean the Hindi bit? Sorry? The, end the end. Hindi bit? Yeah, the prevailing tone of his stories. Okay, just give me a minute. Keep talking while I look for it. Page 52. Um, page 52. Page, no, it's page 19. Oh, okay. You wanted, you wanted the last bit of Uncle Rafi, you said, yeah? Yeah, the prevailing tone of his stories. Yeah. Sorry, Uncle Rafi is hiding from me. Just a minute. Um. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about this. Keep talking, please. And yeah, you know, Can I, I just want, yeah. Sorry, I just yeah, want sure. to. Yes, you go ahead. Sit you go. One, one comment because he has uh, perhaps Sucharita will be talking about this. Other, uh, he has put that poetry into his prose poems, as I uh, see it or as I could term it. But he's also done, um, he's also translated Hijab Ismail and, uh -huh. uh, you know, and uh, that I had carried in this uh, poetry journal uh, called Poetry at Sangam. And I thought it was poetry and edited it as it were with poetry where I thought the breath was expanding or the breath was contracting. So it's interesting to see this uh, conversation as it were of poetry coming into prose poem and prose poem as it were, because Hijab is very poetic, her writing, her sensibility coming mm. in poetry back again you know which happens mm -hmm. there do you remember um, yes of course i do okay uh, they came out in a book called fafnir's breath i think yes <laughs> and fafnir's heart fafnir's heart yeah and it's still there on poetry at sangam look yeah. it up i i will do yeah okay I've, I'm, I'm with you uh yeah. now with with uncle rafi yeah. The prevailing tone of his stories is light and witty, worldly but never cynical, tinged with romance. In one, a young woman manages to reach her lost love by an astute or accidental use of subtitles in a silent film. Later stories show, show an awareness of the nuances of class and economics of marriage. In Mahabbat Ka Bulava, my own favorite, a young man falls in love with his friend's sister, whose tutor he is. And when his loved one's very rich father forbids the marriage, not only do the lovers elope, but the hero's friend escapes with them to set up a life away from the rigid social norms of his family. How would Rafi Ajmeri have fared in the progressive era that was just dawning then? Would his liberal attitudes have hardened into dogma, or would he have swung to conservatism in the Pakistan to which his brothers migrated as he too probably would have had, as he too probably would have? Or would his fictions have echoed the calm voice of conscience? No way of telling the one short bitter text of his suggests another direction he might have taken. Here he retells from an old song the legend of the bandit Dayagujet who robbed the king's wife of her jewels to please his demanding wife. Amma ko mera ram ram kehna, baina ko mera salam. Gujri ko bas itna kehna rehe jaye jo ban kore tham. Daya ab aana nahi, daya jilmi ke pande, daya paasi ke pande. Give my greetings to my mother and sister, but to the Gujri just say, make good use of, uh, to make good use of her youth. That isn't coming back. He's in the clutches of the oppressor. The noose is around his neck. As I read it, I could hear my grandmother's singing voice, my hair still on end as it did when I first heard the story sung. So that to me was a memoir, talking about genre, that to me was a memoir, but it was not my memory. It was a memory of my elder. Yes. Uh, and a memory ensconced in history or even forgotten history. Yeah, and, and the voices, it's uh, the way you end it with your grandmother's voice ringing in your ears. Mm. And I, I could almost hear her singing the words too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, this, this is still at a distance. In the second part of the book where you write your personal stories, you write the, the memoir pieces, that's much more immediate. And yes. it's 
cuts to distance yourself from the your, and it's it's much more the inward gaze has deepened in those. There yes, is there, yeah. there is questioning. There is you know this uh, rumination all the time. So I was wondering, you know, um, how challenging or how easy was it for you to write about something that is much more immediate, much more present? Oh, it's terrifying! A distance, it's a terrifying. I think you realize that what you've been doing all your life is when you. Uh, write about uh, contemporary affairs. You, you create yeah. characters who are composites, characters that combine elements of different friends of yours, or you know, elements of yourself, and uh, elements that glue uh, these different aspects of the personality together. Uh, which, of course, are from your psychological insights, if you have any, or philosophical ruminations. But when you actually create a narrator who, even if he's disguised, like I have a Murad and I have a Mehran and I have an I who's not always exactly me. You, while you're writing, know that you're writing very, very, very close to the bone. And in fact, tearing off strips of skin in order to be able to do that, it is scary. It's scary. But it's also immersive. Yes. yes. And of course, it was a terrifying time we were living in. I mean, you know, for four months, we were just completely uh, isolated from each other. My own niece who lived downstairs could barely see me. She used to stand in the doorway and talk to me. And uh, we were terrified of what was going to happen. It seemed as if, you know, it was doomsday almost. And because of the requests that were coming to me to write stories, and that particular story I think you're referring to, at least uh, in passing, The Garden Spy, was actually a response to someone in Karachi asking me if I would write a story about the pandemic as it was happening. That was Taha Keha, who himself is a novelist and journalist. And that seemed to open some doors. But as I said, the door had already been opened with uh, what is saved, which is much more fictionalized. But at the same time, something was happening that was making me look within. I mean, you know, in what is saved, much of the reflection on, on, on the past and on history is through the eyes of an artist who didn't really exist. But then as I move on, the reflection is through myself. So even when, for example, I talk about Han Su Yen, I'm talking about my relationship with her and how she made me think about nation and belonging and language and dispossession. Yeah. So um, could I please read from uh, your uh, Suin of Friendship? Yes, uh, please. Yeah, a, a very brief passage. And I, I'd mm -hmm. like to ask you something about uh, what you just mentioned about home and homelessness and mm -hmm. roots, yeah? So this is from uh, Suin of Friendship. Uh, okay. My contradictions grew when I went back home on a lecture tour later that year. Returning to Karachi after more than two decades to see the streets of my city bristling with ethnic strife and inter-party warfare. Reclaiming Pakistan had made my fragile anchor slip away and my feet were sliding on slippery sand. My terms of belonging had changed. I was not home. I wasn't a Westerner of foreign origin. I was not someone who, to quote Suin, happened to live abroad and went back to my roots. I was someone who had left behind a homeland and never found anything to replace the empty patch. Wherever I was, I'd always look for a part of myself in the city I'd been sent away from. As I wrote then, all my mirrors of belonging have cracked. I came back to London and began to write my most difficult, tangled stories. My second collection came out after a long struggle. Your, uh, this idea of homelessness, of home, of roots, occurs in other stories also, Amir. I was wondering, you know, is it the written word that you are grappling with, the page on which you find the written word, that conveys a sense of home much more than a physical space or entity? Would, would you say that as a writer? No, I think that I could very often write myself right into homelessness. It was a re reminder in many ways, and it's not just my own, it's that many people around me. 
because people are so profoundly displaced in so many ways. I mean, people are even displaced from their village to their city. I see this when I go to Pakistan so often. You know? And around me, of course, you know, I grew up uh, in, in London, surrounded by exiles from Poland and Iran and Afghanistan and Ethiopia and so on and so forth. I myself was not an exile, but in the many years that Zia, ul -Haq, ruled Pakistan or misruled Pakistan, I, I didn't go home. You know, I felt uh, it was unethical to go back. Now I slightly regret it because that time was far too long. And now when I'm asked if I would visit a country which had a cruel ruler, I say yes, if I have close friends there, I would. But at that time, I turned my back on my country. Luckily, I had another country, which was India, my mother's, my motherland and my mother's land, which I could go to when I did. But going back to Pakistan was more profound in some ways because Karachi was where I grew up and where I learned everything in it that I carried with me. I saved up a lot from Karachi. So that first exposure was traumatic because looking back now, I realized that I felt I would have to embrace it by and by, and I did. And as you know, in the years you've known me, I've been back very often. I work in Pakistan a lot and uh, engage a lot with people there and so on and so forth. At the moment, again, I'm feeling a distance for various reasons I won't go into. But I did become somebody who belonged to two or maybe even more places rather than belonging nowhere. I had a multiple sense of belonging. To answer your question about the page, I think I felt uh, when I was in my 50s that I had to write an Urdu. That was you know, something I had said just a year before. I was in conversation with Sarah Saleri somewhere. And we both expressed a kind of nostalgia for Urdu, which we both loved and felt could express certain things that English couldn't. And I said, I think it's too late. I'll never write an Urdu. And a year later, I did. And there was this sense of arrival. I won't say homecoming, but there was a sense of arrival when I wrote my first story in Urdu. Uh, suddenly, the gateways of a language were flung open. That was an adventure. And it was a completely different process from writing in English for a very long time. Because English just flows out of me. Urdu doesn't. It's, uh, in a sense, to come back to what Priya was talking about, it was like writing poetry to begin with. Each word was carefully chosen. I also realized then that I don't think in a language, and this might be, um, a result of being at least potentially bilingual. That uh, when I write, it's the, the visual images that are most important. And because of the way English comes to me very easily, uh, I hadn't realized how visual my uh, imagination was. In Urdu, I really realized that because I was literally you know, raising a hand and looking for a word in the air. Later, the process became more natural and it became closer to the way I write in English. Does that answer your question to some extent? Yeah, to an extent. You also mentioned that, uh, you know, you drew inspiration for images from Urdu poetry, Hindi poetry and uh, Persian. Yeah. So your images come from poetry. Not all. Of, yeah, not all of them. But yes, that, that has had a image making i mean you know the faculty the facility to to make images i think does derive from the fact that i studied Urdu poetry at university and heard it all my life some and persian poetry also came fairly naturally to me i also read a lot in italian french english but i think that but the poetic tradition of the east is much more important i grew up listening to mira and kabir sang and then i read a lot of them as well in my teens so that's there as well i think evocations of nature particularly in my older fiction, come a lot from me away. Yeah, and music. And, and, uh, and what about painting, Amir? The miniature yeah. tradition, I know we've spoken about it. And as a matter of mm -hmm. fact, I think the last time we met was to go to the BNA, the Nath, the huge Nath paintings that we saw. Miniature, mm -hmm. spoke a lot about it. I find yeah. that, you know, the, the detail of nature say the swans coming up the coils coming up the, this um the way it kind of comes through the page and becomes alive the flowering jacaranda the presentness of it for me seems to come a lot from visual traditions of the subcontinent traditions. yeah it's funny priya that a lot of that actually just comes from my walks my rambles and parks Right. My drive, you know, yeah, but that nature, that nature imagery. Somebody, in fact, in Pakistan has written a long article about it. Uh, he said, You write uh, eco fiction, and I was not aware of that at all. He says, You always have these birds and so on. Of course, the swan comes from the fact that I 
all the swans in my stories are real. I've seen each one of them on uh, the lake nearby. Uh, but of course, as I went on reading about swans, there are lots of swans, of course, in, in the Jatak tales, but also in the Raja Rasalu cycle, which is a Punjabi cycle about uh, um, a particular royal family. And they have these stories of swans which are adapted from the Buddhist ones, but they've been made much more raunchy in a way. Mm. You know, there's a story about a swan and a crow, which I think I have in a convalescence in this book. So yeah, they did come from those. Uh, visuals, I don't know about the tradition of the miniature, Priya. I actually love miniatures. I love Mughal art and Indian art and Chinese art. But painting in the stories, actually, I feel I'm more influenced by um, Western well, modernism. I see. Okay. Yeah. I would think that's, yeah. What, what, what is evoked when I describe a painting is more likely to be a Western painting okay. or a Westernized painting, if well, or 20th century tradition. Yeah. Okay. Your, your stories also, uh, Amir, you know, and uh, I have a question for both of you, having the two of you here, I'd, you know, I must ask this question. Uh, in, in your stories, I noticed that uh, names in, in one story appear in another, events yeah. in one story, you know, reappear in another story. And yeah. Often, it, uh, I get the feeling that it it was consciously done. You know, it was consciously done. It was consciously done. Yes, yes I would think so. Okay, okay. So uh, this is what I wanted to ask the two of you. Uh, given the kind of uh, writing you do, uh, we know that often we allow uh, or we give in to the story. We let it lead us, mm -hmm. and we also control. So uh, for the two of you. What is it you control when you're writing and what is it that controls you? Your take first, Amir. This is your book. Uh, sitting here now, not having written a story for a year, and uh, written other things, but not a short story. I've done some translations and so on. Uh, I think the story controls me pretty much. And then I decide that I'm going to put those cues in that links it to another story. What very often happens to Joe is that the stories uh, I feel need to be completed. I, I, I start a story somewhere which is just uh, a sidetrack, you know, which is just a, by, a kind of bylane in the story. And that little clue clings to me and wants to be expanded. So then I carry on and write another story, and the cue will be in that story that leads it back to the older one. You know? And I also decide to exclude certain things in stories, like in some of my stories, the fact that I sang when I was a teenager or in my 20s is deliberately excluded so that that character is not me. He's not in love with you know, uh, the art of singing, as it were. So I'll remove that. Or in fact, I think in the Garden Spy, there's no mention of uh, Mehran limping, so that he's not Murad of what is saved. Is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so things like that, I'm careful about, and I look at them and I remove things. I add things later. Those stories, the 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 kinds of contemporary ones, take a lot more time. Even though what is saved again was written in two days or something, but. Uh, Normally, they take a lot of time. They take a lot more curating, if you see what I mean. Yeah. But yes, I do feel the story to a large extent controls me rather than my being in control of it. Okay. Yeah. And the idea is always just a whisper in my ear when I begin. It's not really something that's uh, very complete or very uh, defined. Okay. Yeah. Since we're talking about memoir too, and I've just begun a memoir called The Archive of Absences on uh, talking about all the photographs of my childhood that I don't have. So it's entirely based on absent photographs. And one chapter has come out in, in a Singapore-based journal. And um, I know that when I'm writing this memoir, my uh, my skin seems to be bleeding because it's so close. You know, you're just pouring all over. And then, uh, uh, because you don't want to go somewhere, 
and those questions of how far are you going? How fair are you being to a person who is mute, either through death or some kind of silence? That is such a heavy burden. So with memoir, I'm, I have to try to tell myself to surrender. And then I edit. And it is only when I'm sure of the emotion the, uh, in the memoir that it is true that I continue. If I think I'm sidestepping it or faking it, I stop and put it away. With the story, it takes over. And you're walking <clears throat> and walking and walking around, as it were, a, a half formed idea, as Amir said, you know, it's just a whisper. It's something you don't know. And then it's like a whirlpool, you slip into it and hide, and then the story slowly expands. And speaking, if uh, I put for a moment about the connection between poetry and fiction, because there is always this flux uh, in Amir's work too. Uh, recently, what I found is that people, you know, they want, when they say story, and that is one thing I'm so among them. Many things I love about this book is its brevity, its terseness, its short, not terseness, its fullness, but briefness, you know, its, its exactness, the exactitude of language. Um, but when I'm writing stories now, commissioned to write, they say, oh, about 4,000 words. And because I've told this to Dibya, uh, what happens is I get to about a thousand words because my story as it were is told in that time unless there is another idea springing forth it's the poetry that comes that in is. and edits this i'm compressing it or distilling it i don't do uh, poetry has its own kind of editing which you do you know so that is what happens but it's a story set it's a narrative it's it's that which keeps going. That I'd like to add that when I think of something as a memoir, like you know, when I was asked to write about Hans Suyin or Kurutulain Heder, or there's a piece in this about my teacher, they're as true as memory allows them to be, but a lot of them are very fact based in the sense that I do you know, research what I'm doing, I check dates, I check events, and so on and so forth. And I don't fictionalize, I don't add anything. If there's something that I've forgotten, I just write clearly in the middle of the memoir. Sorry, I've forgotten this. I don't remember. It may have been this way, but yeah, I try not to. I, I don't invent. In those portraits of people, I don't invent them at all. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if it become a story, I would change the names, I would change the dates, like the other Jaffe story, which is you know, floating in the world of fiction and imagination, even if it's inspired by something real. So, in fact, you know that in a memoir, the facts take control. The shape is what is something that one gropes towards and finds sometimes in the darkness. I have a question for Suchilita, yeah. and that is Suchilita. I know that the new stories. Yes, you put it at towards the end, but how did you pace it out? Make the selection. What? form the shape of the book. Okay, uh, so uh, as far as selection is concerned, because I had been reading Amer for a long time, mm. I had some preferences. Mm. And uh, Amer sent those in, but we realized that we needed more. Mm. Yeah, And um, these uh, stories, like the tales from Attar, you know, the, the retellings, mm. the tales, those, uh, those were very dear to me. But then Amir had this new writing, you mm. know, which was bringing in a completely different tonal mm. tonality to the yeah. book, you know, yeah. and uh, mm. it was providing that perfect balance mm. from the retelling of something heard, something read, to the retelling of the self, Beautiful. right? Mm. So when he was retelling in, in these pieces, when he's retelling the self, when he's retelling his life stories, his life experiences. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the inward gaze had deepened so much that, you know, you were in the skin of the mm. narrator. Mm. 
mm. you know, and mm. that intensified the experience of the book, mm. the experience of mm. reading the book. Mm. So we thought, uh, and of course, it was a collaborative um, exercise in putting uh, together the titles. Mm. So we thought, let's have the tales and the retellings, mm. and then bring in this absolutely contemporary, absolutely um, a punch in the face, in the guts that kind of a writing. So you have a perfect balance. And of course, what I wanted constantly was this timeline and the kind of people that Amel was writing about to you know, mm. uh, draw a historical continuum from one mm. to the other. So mm. you're beginning in the 12th, 13th centuries mm. and you're coming right down to the peri-pandemic years. Mm. So that kind of, and we wanted that linear, although Amel's writing does not given to this linear kind of telling or mm -hmm. no memory or that concept of time but for the structure of the book this is what we wanted because that reflected not only the range of writing it was but also this historical continuum sort of mm. so right that's how we have this in the beginning and then we come in with that but of course you started with pieces from my life which then segued into uh the tales and then came back to them. So, the, the, in the beginning, it's my childhood and my mother and my great uncle. And then the fables lead on from the histories, including the Sheikhta story, which is told like a fable. And then we go into the retellings and then we go into the stories that are from my own imagination, but are told like folk tales, Hermitage, the yes. lake, the blue bead, etc. And then yeah. you move to the pandemic. Yeah. So, that's, I think what we haven't talked about are those little stories that are, in fact, hybrids of uh, fable and modernity would you like to read one of those the short enough uh yeah i'll just shall i just read the question, uh, just one more about the hermitage maybe or the lake the lake is short enough i think uh, the mean? lake is one i'm very fond of the lake of course mm -hmm. i yeah. just want to oh, ask I'd which do yeah. you which do you enjoy writing the most which kind of uh enjoy definitely stories like hermitage lake stories that come from my own imagination but have a they float away from you know uh, uh harsh realism I mean, they, they 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 adopt the tone of a fable but actually they're telling you about things that are very close to our lives so i mean if you look at the at lake it's actually about adolescent trauma yeah. but, uh, but it reads like it could even be a children's story. Just tell me when I've read for too long and I'll just leave it and we'll hope that our readers will pick up the book and, and continue. As a boy, Metham had often walked by the lake. It mes mesmerized him in winter when it was glassy and in summer when it mirrored the sun's reddish rays. He'd play on its banks in warm weather with his friends. Some of the boys would take off their shirts, jump in and splash around in the water, then come out shivering in their drenched trousers. But Mesem, who couldn't swim, never joined them in the water until one day one of his friends promised to reward him if he did. The water was icy even though it was summer. He felt the lake would swallow him whole. His friend swam away and left him there, watching him from a distance as he spluttered and gasped until he struggled to the grassy bank, slipping and sliding on the glass smooth pebbles on the lake's bed. On the lake's bed. Later, he didn't remember whether his friend had kept his promise and rewarded him with a banknote or a book, but he always remembered the cold, white water and his spluttering fear of drowning. Along with these fears, he was afraid, too, of making new friends, who would lead him to flail in icy water, as his playmates had done that summer day. At boarding school in his teens, he was congenial with his fellow students and courteous to his teachers. He joined in discussions and debates, but he usually walked alone. Messam liked walking alone. When he went home in his holidays from his first term at university, he would set off on his own and stroll for miles, watching birds and squirrels and the greening branches of trees and rabbits and other little creatures scurrying in the bushes. One day near the end of spring, he was walking on the path that led to a wooden hill when he saw deer sprinting ahead, a creature that seemed both remote and unafraid of him. It seemed to be leading him on up the hill, as if in a trance Messam followed. In a short while, he found himself at the peak of the hill at the end of a lake he was sure he had seen before, though he knew it couldn't be the one he had played by as a child. He had lost sight of the running deer as if it vanished, as if it had vanished into the silver ripples of the lake. The walk had made him hot. 
He was perspiring and had long since drunk all the water in the bottle he had carried in his rucksack. He bent down and slipped lake water from his cupped palms. Then he took off his shirt and vest and splashed cold water in his face and head. The sting of the water made him gasp, but he went on splashing himself, bathing his shoulders and bare chest until he was shivering in the sunlight. He rolled up his trouser legs nearly to the knee and washed his feet and his calves. For a moment, he had the urge to, de to dive deep into the lake's depths, but for now, the bracing feel of its water on his skin was enough. When he had refreshed himself, he lay down on a reedy slope dotted with yellow-breasted white flowers and closed his eyes for a while. From a nearby tree, he heard a bird song, low at first and insistent and raw, until in response, a higher sound, shrill as a whistle, came from another tree. Was the bird's call a warning to his mate to guard her nest from an intruder? A faint breeze was soughing through the leaves, and the water too was singing. And it seemed to him that if one listened to the silence, everything sang to everything else, breeze to water and leaves, water to cloud and branch, birds to the sky. I'll leave it there. There are two more paragraphs. You could complete reading the story. Okay. Because it and changes the direction. Questions for the audience. He, he wondered fleetingly how it would be if someone were beside him to share the water and the sky and the silence. Then, as if on a small screen, he saw himself in his university classroom, seated next to a classmate who, in spite of mess and reserve demeanor, had always been friendly to him. Often the classmate had offered advice, offered to lend or share books. He asked Messam more than once if he'd seen a certain film or if Messam had ever used a swimming pool on campus. But before he could invite him to join, Messam had made awkward excuses to escape to his hostel room and the company of his books. Then one day the boy ran after him and told him he'd received a parcel from home with bread, biscuits, fruit, nuts and sweets, which were hard to come by in the city, inexpensive too. Would Messam like to share a meal with him right there on the campus that day? Messam abruptly refused. After that, the boy began to withdraw. On the last day of term before he left for the holidays and home, Messam had attended the college social as he was tacitly obliged to do. He, did, he daydreamed through the speeches and performance until the hall went dark and a few musical notes plucked singly echoed across the room. After some silent moment, a, a spotlight fell on a lone figure with a traditional lute, and the pace and rhythm of the notes increased, sounding now like wind, now like rain, and now again like the cascade of water over rocks. It was his classmate, the one whose offer of friendship he had so rudely refused. And now, reminded of, the distant mu of that distant music in the sunlight, he began making all sorts of plans for his return. He would try harder with his classmates. And though he knew himself too well to think he'd ever make overtures to strangers, he would at least respond to the friendly gestures of others. But before he left and packed his bags, he was going for another dip, dip in the lake. And when he went back to university, he would ask the young man who had offered him companionship to teach him to play the lute. Thank you. Thank you, Anir. So that story was written from my imagination, but then I met a young man called Messam who wanted to play the lute. And he said, well, this story seems just like me. So I added the lute to the story after meeting him. Okay. And he got the lute and learned to play it. But at the moment, it's stuck uh, in, in, in a small town with broken strings, which have to be repaired. So that's uh, another end to the story, which I hope is not final. Okay. Thank you. Uh, questions from the audience? Yeah, I mean, one, I just want to make one comment. Yeah, please. Uh, you had asked me about it as a story lead you. It's not a question about being led by the story. It is that you surrender to the story. Surrender. Yes. Completely. Absolutely. It doesn't lead you. Yeah, you give it exactly. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So what controls you? Okay. And a story can change shape as well. The same story can take another shape later. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I didn't really hear what you said, right? Oh, I just said it. You know, she uh, she had asked this question about what lead, does a story lead you? And I said it's not a question of being led by the story. It's a question. It's surrendering to the story. Lab. Divya, I need to reappear. 
Maybe we'll put a phone room side like that. Okay, this. Where okay. is it? Is it Libya? So, yeah, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> yeah. I'm here. So, any questions? Any, any comments? I mean, you don't have to ask questions, you can simply comment also. Or at least pick up a copy of the book <laughs> since you are here. <laughs> Not at least. Let's do it. <laughs> we have another title also, along with Amir's uh, hunger. Those who want to write and ask questions to Dibya, you know about your books. Kinjal, you want to ask something? <laughs> so what is time? We are in Pune. No, Kinjal is working on a manuscript, uh, so probably she can ask how to finish it. Uh, <laughs> now I like to make the comment. <laughs> <laughs> I need a year more. <laughs> <laughs> Just bring up my more. You want to talk about it? <laughs> so we've tried our best to prepare anybody else. Yeah, I know. Mm. In the, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have a question for Amit. Uh, yes. In, in the first few chapters, music plays a heavy role. Yes. This, while you're writing, do, do you have it playing, or how much does music you know, play a role in your writing? Uh, can I see who's speaking? Okay. No, you. You have to come here. Okay. Right, yeah, yes. And your name is? Sorry? Yeah, name. Your name? With Sumit. Okay. I uh, listen to music all the time. It's probably my greatest joy. Uh, and I listen to all kinds of music, above all folk music from the subcontinent, but from Mediterranean countries as well, from Ireland, Scotland, uh, classical music, uh, Indian classical music. Um, the Sufi tradition. I don't like Qawwali very much. Everybody, every, everyone is shocked about that. But I'm, I'm not fond of Qawwali. It's not something I would listen to alone. But I listen to a lot of other kinds of folk traditions. Kafi and Vai from uh, in Siraiki and Sindhi, for example. I love uh, Carnatic music. I love Sambu Subalakshmi and also some very modern, postmodern uh, Tamil singing which is a combination of Carnatic and so on. So yes, I listen to music all the time. I don't play music while I'm writing because uh, uh, I think music dominates my senses much more than uh, language does. So I listen a lot before and after, but not while I'm writing. The music is off. I, I like to write in a certain kind of silence. I don't mind people walking around me and talking actually at all. But music would make me go into, because music has its own silences that draw you in. And I remember when we first met, the very first meeting over at a friend's house in London over lunch, Amir sang. He sang Karnataka music. Krishnani Begani Baro. That is what you sang. You know that. Just, day. A, bit, just a fragment of it, yes. Yes, a bit of it. But, yeah. you know, it was there from. And the you gave time. me a version of it by Unni Krishnan later on. <laughs> yes. I yeah, did. I love that. It's one of my favorite uh, yeah, songs in the world. So yes, every kind of music, jazz as well, some pop. I don't like film music that much, but you know, even that sometimes if there's a very good song, I, I listen. A Pakistani music from the 50s movies I like. Uh, so yeah, absolutely every kind. But my predilection is really for folk traditions. There's a story here, uh, it's called The Lady of the Lotus, mm -hmm. which is a retelling from his mother's uh, journal entries about yeah. her training yeah. music. Yeah. Yeah, that's directly from her diary with some intercalations from myself. Yeah. 
But I mean, all I did was to take her first person writing and put it into the third person with little uh, references to her first person uh, sentences as well. And then my own voice, so it's really, you know, three, uh, three levels of uh, music, if you like, three kinds of notations. Yes. Yeah, other questions. Uh, hi, Amin. Uh, I wanted to ask: uh, Do you have like a specific place that you like to write in? Because you said that you don't mind having people around you. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it like like do you go somewhere to write, or do you write at home mostly? Oh, absolutely at home. Okay. Absolutely at home. And I used to have a particular place that I wrote in. Uh, looking uh, out of a window, I like to look at uh, trees and branches while I write. I haven't written in that place for a little while, but that's, yeah, that used to be my favorite place. But I don't have a routine as such. I know now that I write best in the morning. I mean, I can open my eyes and start to write. And especially if I have to write something for a newspaper, for example, I do a regular column sort of every two months for the leading English uh, daily and, and, and I do it for the Sunday supplement in Karachi early in the morning. A story will come at any time, but I also know that when the evening when evening falls, I usually stop writing fiction. I think a lot of the Garden Spy was actually written in the evening, but otherwise it'll normally be during the daytime. Can I just ask one follow-up question then? Um, yes, of course, anything. What kinds of reading do you do when you writing something i mean to say if you're if you stop writing fiction at some point mm -hmm. in these things uh are you writing anything after that and what kinds of reading are you then doing around those oh uh, i try to read i mean this is my conscious effort to read something that's not very like what i'm writing okay. and uh, if i'm writing in english i prefer to read in italian or urdu or french or spanish and funnily enough, when I'm writing in Urdu, I like to read in Urdu. <laughs> That's really interesting. Thank you. It is, isn't it? Yeah, because I always feel less confident about my ability in Urdu. So I feel if I'm reading it, you know, the vocabulary will keep growing. So perhaps the book of poetry. Ah, also, when I'm writing in English, I read English poetry quite a lot. I have some favorite poets and I, I, I'll go to those. Less so recently, but I've done a lot of that in the past. But I'm a very eclectic reader. Yeah, uh, this is a question to all three of you. Hi, Priya. Um, yeah. uh, to all three of you as authors, how do you know when a story is finished? Do you? I never that... know. I never know. You just let go of it. Yeah. <laughs> You, yeah. you asked us to come back to it, back to a yes. story years later, yes. and said, thought to yourself, or that you could rework it, or have you actually done it, or is that a no no? No, absolutely, I've done that with many stories. In fact, this one story which I finalized after seven years, I kept going back to it. And when I first wrote that story, I wrote it uh, with <laughs> some immense anger at what was what was happening. And my story was my story, right? Uh, when I read it, I realized that it wasn't the story of the characters, in, uh, you know, or of the place. It was basically a story of the place, but I had imposed my story on it. So I kept, I rewrote and rewrote and rewrote till, you know, I had the characters and they were leading the story. They were taking the story along. And like Priya said, I surrendered. And after I had surrendered and uh, the characters started speaking, the place took over. I realized that, yes, now it is taking the form it should have taken. Yeah. yeah Likewise. I, I mean, Lake had been published uh, uh, in two different versions. And if you count the Urdu translation, three. Yeah. Because it became uh, changed completely halfway. And I, one of my stories took me 24 years to write or something mad like that. No, 20. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think. There are those occasional stories or poems, even, you know, which might just be um, ninety-three words, which you which you go back to after years. But 
I think what Amir said, the word he used, you abandon it, is what rings true. Because you work on it, you put it away. After you sleep for it, you go back to it, look at it once, twice, and then <coughs> it has its own life. Yeah. And it has its own way it has it. I, I do love the last line. You know, that's very often very important. Like in Hermitage, the last line is very important. And in another story that I think you know, such as that was also published in India, the last collection that came out there, that Seven Bridges, um, Love and Its Seasons, the last line, the last paragraph is very important, and that's almost the essence of the whole story. For me, but otherwise, yeah. sorry. Yeah, carry well, no, I was just saying that for me, if I don't get the names of the characters right, if they do not seem to belong organically to the world of the story, I can't move on. You know, mm. even think the story is complete, I keep going back to it and the name seems to arise from the story, belong to it. So that and of course how it ends. These two, if I have in place, I'm, I know that, okay, I'm like closing in on, you know, wrapping it up. Yeah, I, I I can I can identify with that, with both those things. Sorry to answer, Sucharita. Then when you are writing oh, something, so do you um do you not have the names of characters already? I mean, not always. So then, how how do you sort of refer to them when you start to write? I wait for the name to come to me. So you say the girl, the boy, the man, the name. No, I just put in a. Yeah, I'll have a bit, but I That's wait. But but though. still then I really yeah. cannot get the, 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 you know, I can't get the feel of the story. Uh, in fact, uh, the novel that I've been working on for, I don't know, ages now, yeah. I I had it ready and I thought I had it ready, let me say that. And uh, then things didn't work. I, I asked friends as well, also read, you know, and uh, I realized what was not working was the name of the protagonist. Oh. And I could not, it was a completed uh, manuscript, about uh, 90,000 words. I came back, the, the name wasn't working. I tried various permutations and combinations of that one, of those letters. Finally, I got it and it just seemed to you know, drop into the into the world of the story. It just seemed to you know, then fit there. It was like made for the story. And then I could go on with the edits. You know what I so, find, it, sorry. Yeah, what I find interesting sometimes is when you're writing and uh, say you don't get that first line or you don't get the tone of that character, you write in longhand and you imagine the way the character writes. Do they loop their L's? Do they scribble? You know, is it round? Do they dot their eyes? What? How do they write? The scribble. And that leads me into the character. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's the name of the character who doesn't try to think? I still try to think of, uh, of how they would speak something. something. You know, some, and would they speak again, you know, in a flowery way? Would they be abrupt? How does their breath move? Is it short? You know, do, do they construct clause after clause after clause? How is it? It's a breath. That's, That's really an example. Pardon? It's really beautiful. beautiful your Thank you. I think very interesting. Thank you. Amir. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, do you want to talk about uh, the breath? in your story is the sentence, the length of the sentences. What controls it? I mean, like, for example, in dub, the first part is one sentence. Yes, it's completely intuitive, but I know that I don't want to stop the sentence. In other places, I just want them to be shorter. And very often in the edit, my sentences will become shorter. Ah. But yeah, but but uh, Dove just came to me like that. It came like you know a long, long, long kind of uh, episode of music that was playing in my ear, and it had to be captured in one sentence. And an editor tried to change it and asked me 
if I would uh, manicure the sentence a little bit. And I said, no way, I'm not publishing it this way. Right. But, um, uh, when you were writing, are you uh, when you were writing a story, uh, except for the plot line or the characters, do you worry about the emotional movement in the story? Because uh, the stories that I just have read, you know, they were very moving. So, are you aware of the movement, or it, it is coming? Just you know, natural, that's right. Is it for me? Yeah. Mm, did you just uh, compress that sentence a little bit? The question? Yes. Yeah, so uh, while you were writing a story, mm -hmm. uh, apart from the plot line or the characters, mm -hmm. are you consciously working on the emotional movement? Yes, I think emotion is most important to me. While I was listening to the others speaking, I realized that the characters come to me almost fully formed. That is something. I always say character is not the most important thing in a story, but actually the people, the personages of my story come to me fully formed. And what I have to discover is their emotional depth. So in something like Lake, for example, which I read out to you, which to quote you, Suchitita, um, Perhaps the longer stories have more introspection, more philosophical musing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But a story like that, you have to know the inner character, the, the inner soul of the character that you're writing about. So you know, this is a young man who's afraid of living, afraid of friendship, afraid of cold water, and music draws him out. So that emotional movement is extremely important. And rewriting the story was about discovering the emotional movement by actually m meeting someone who brought my character to life. And likewise, in something like Dove, which Priya read out, <clears throat> you have to trace that whole movement between the young woman, the girl who heard the dove, and the older woman who sees her or hears her disappointment in history embodied in the sound of the dove. Yeah, that emotional movement is absolutely crucial, and if it's not there, then the story is not working. Of course, there are stories in which there isn't that kind of movement. They're deliberately distilled and distanced, like uh, Attar and so on and so forth. They have a different kind of message, so I would follow that. Mm. So is this intuitive to you, or is it kind of deliberate? Uh, intuitive. A deliberated intuition. It begins with intuition, and then it's about listening and discovering. It's as if I'm sitting with the character and listening to their emotions and mm. uh, filtering them through my own understanding. Mm. Because a lot of my characters are very different from myself. Very different. Thank you. So that's a good question. I don't He's saying something to you. Yes. You were saying something. Mm -hmm. I said it's a good question. Okay. Yeah, so it's a good question. Okay, so we are done today. Thank you, Amir. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, Dibya. And thank you, Sujarita. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's been a very, for... very enjoyable afternoon. Yes. For me, it's an afternoon. For you, it's an evening. Yeah. <laughs> and get this book. Yes, this is what please. I would like to end with. Because it is... When she says I'm very effusive, I'm not. I'm just <laughs> honest. And I think this is a remarkable... Um, Thank you. ...experiment in, in and, and way of storytelling, which especially since you're a writer's group, would be seminal to you guys. On that infused thought again. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for asking me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. So I'm saying bye right now. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to run okay, Bye all. Bye. 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 Bye.
see you. I post. See you soon. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Hi, it's so good to see you after so long. So many, huh? so many years. I know. An open space figure, <laughs> didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, open space figure, which you guys used to do. No, no, no. Yeah. Did you guys plan this? No, completely. Everywhere. You were a small history. Okay. Nice to see you. I used to read your Sangha book before it changed. Right, right, right. Yeah. Thank you. So, where are you now? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Yeah. Oh, you know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not.